the, the second presentation was supposed to be done by um, Lebogang Matlakpa. Um, I hope I, I pronounced your name correctly. Um, she was previously affiliated with um, the UCT, but she's currently a project manager at um, African Foundation working on Oceans Without Borders program in Johannesburg in South Africa. Uh, she completed a master's degree in oceanography in a project focused on the seasonal characteristics of phytoplankton bloom phenology in the Benguela upwelling system. And she was supervised by quite a few people, Sandy, Marie, um, Marcelo, and uh, Dior. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Leborang Matlakala, and I, am <clears throat> I will be presenting um, some of my master's work um, that I worked with a couple of researchers from the CSIR and from UCT, as well as from NATMAC, um, our very own Dion Law, uh, who I believe is part of the seminar. And for my master's project, we were interested in, in understanding the seasonal characteristics of phytoplankton bloom phenology in the Northern Benguela upwelling system. And I think it's undeniable the role that phytoplankton plays in securing food security, in, 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 in food security and securing food supply, and also the role it plays in driving the biogeochemical processes in the ocean and how that ultimately affects the air sea gas exchange. And also we, we can sort of look at phytoplankton as key indicators of climate change due to their ability to, due to their uh, sensitivity to environmental change. So we were looking at understanding this from and understanding the climate implication, climate change, climate implication phytoplankton has. Um, so, so looking at our project, we decided to, to focus on three phytoplankton groups. And those were the dinoflagellates, the coccolithophores, and the diatoms. So the dinoflagellates are particularly known for being responsible for most of the harmful algal blooms that we see in the Benguela upwelling system from the north and to the south coast of South Africa. So they're predominantly known to be responsible for most of the harmful algal blooms that we see. But coccolithophores and diatoms play a role and contribute to the carbon cycle of the ocean. So, but we, we were actually interested in these three groups because they are known to be primary producers of dimethyl sulfide. And dimethyl sulfide that is created, predominantly no, mostly known as CMSP, is produced in the ocean by these phytoplankton groups, although diatoms do not produce as much DMSP as the coccolithophores and the dinoflagellates do. But most species of these diatoms actually do produce this dimethyl sulfide. And once this dimethyl sulfide is produced in the ocean, it gets converted into sulfate aerosols. And these sulfate aerosols result in cloud condensation nuclei, which then results in an, an, an impact to that cloud albedo and albedo. So the albedo then ultimately result in the decrease in, in, in sunlight that reaches the atmosphere. And that then has implication for the climate uh, change, which then results in the warming of, of, uh, of the environment or the ocean. And that can become a feedback loop if you look at it like that. So that is how we really wanted to understand the DMS and how the cloud, uh, the sulfate aerosols affect the warming of the climate. So um, with that being said, our aim um, was to investigate the seasonal characteristics of phytoplankton bloom phenology, and also to understand the community structure of these blooms in the Northern Benguela upwelling system. So we looked at historical data, we looked at in situ data that was collected by NATMEC in, in the Namibia Ministry of Fisheries. And also we looked at satellite data, long-term satellite data to look at um, the timing of the blooms to try and have an idea of the phenology of the blooms in the Northern Benguela upwelling system. 
So our in-situ data was uh, spent between, I think, 2001 till 2001 to 2012. But some of the years were not sampled and I, I will show you this as, as we progress. But I think um, uh, Mirabilis was used to collect um, majority of this data and the, uh, uh, the phytoplankton subdivision team in the NATMEC were responsible for collecting data, this data, the institute data that we're using at 10 nautical miles and 70 nautical miles, and analyzed yeast phytoplankton up to even species level, which was really valuable information and data that was useful for me. And so really uh, thank you for the team for really making this project um, possible because I, I, I wouldn't have had time to look at this data at this level at this time scale for a master's project. So, and this is how the data I received for these three phytoplankton groups were. So, coccolithophores were not always sampled, though the atoms and, and dinoflagellates were, were mostly sampled. But for the purpose of making use of data that had coccolithophores to compare between the three, among the three phytoplankton groups. I produced this data, which had dinoflagellates and coccolithophores and their atoms, and sort of only picked the months where coccolithophores were sampled or analyzed. Um, and I think if you've worked with coccolithophores, you'd understand how tricky it is to sample coccolithophores. You need a particular filter that's going to filter coccolithophores. It's, it's, it's a very intricate and specific process that you need to do to analyze coccolithophores. And um, here we had some years where we did not have any data for coccolithophores, like 2002, 2003, and 2007. We did not have any data for coccolithophores. And here I'm just showing you the monthly survey. So um, the group used to collect data every monthly collect data of phytoplankton monthly and then sample them in, in the lab. So for 2001, we only had data for, um, for January. And 2004, we only had data for June. 2005, we had data for um, November. So it was, um, I, I, I shared this, I'm sharing this table to show you some of the challenges that we have when it comes to looking at analyzing in situ data, especially long term data, because there's a lot that goes into um, into creating in, into collecting data at this scale with this temporal scale. So um, we had some challenges when it comes to um, analyzing this data and just to show you how we decided to work with this data, because the summer months had very few months. And we decided to, to make a seasonal comparison. We grouped the months into seasons to show how when dinoflagellates, show the concentration of coccolithophores, the atoms and dinoflagellates. And what is important to highlight here is that the table, the key table there, which shows um, maximum cells of coccolithophores, dinoflagellates, and the atoms, and minimum cells of those. But when you look at this graph, it shows you the normalized concentration, meaning we have reduced or normalized the data to one, where one represents the highest concentration and zero represents the lowest concentration. So it is quite clear that dinoflagellates were dominant in this, in this region. Um, and their blooms normally occurred in the spring season, which is the red blocks that we see there, especially in the inshore and offshore. So yeah, it's also important to highlight that we separated our data for inshore and offshore, where inshore was uh, 10 nautical miles and offshore was 70 nautical miles. So diatoms were dominant and dinoflagellates were also dominant in the winter and autumn months. And coccolithophores were also dominant in spring in the offshore, in the inshore region. But when you look at the offshore, dinoflagellates, higher concentrations were seen in autumn and um, not dinoflagellates, uh, yes, dinoflagellates were seen in autumn as well in spring, while coccolithophores were also seen in autumn and diatoms with high concentrations were seen in March. So what I'm trying to highlight is that the bloom 
structures or the peak high concentrations in these um, phytoplankton groups were not the same inshore and offshore. So we were also interested in seeing when do we expect a peak in this um, phytoplankton group in this area and another area. But we could only we could we could already tell that the um, the bloom phenology at inshore and offshore is quite different. Um, that those areas were to highlight some of the months where we see peaks. So to make use of the lot of data that was available, because dinoflagellates and diatoms were sampled quite, um, sorry about that, because diatoms and dinoflagellates were sampled quite frequently, we decided to show um, a monthly data, well, not a yearly data of average of of the concentration of dinoflagellates and diatoms. So our first plot, uh, a, uh, the graph shows um, concentration of dinoflagellates and diatoms. And we can already see that summer months are mostly favorable for diatoms because October, which is not necessarily a summer month, but December and February, that's when we see a peak in diatoms but dinoflagellates are showing a peak in the winter months. And when we look at the offshore regions, we see a peak in dinoflagellates in March and slightly in April, but diatoms tend to peak in July and September. Now the structure of these blooms are also not um, straightforward or the similar to what we, we saw in the in the previous seasonal plot where we had all the three phytoplankton groups. But this is also to highlight that with the seasonal um, um, with the seasonal plot we do miss some of the details that we see in the monthly data. So um, yeah so that's that's what I really wanted to highlight in, in that area. So moving forward to our satellite data we sorry I don't know why this always happens. So our satellite data, we picked uh, the station right off the Namibian coast and we created two triangular, um, triangular subset, and we subset two triangles that were equal at inshore and offshore to sort of understand the dynamics that happen from satellite. And if satellite data, which is really amazing, we were, we're able to look at 21 years of data to analyze these, size, these seasonal cycles of phytoplankton or chlorophyll to say in this area. And we use ocean color to create this data that I'm about to share with you. So looking at chlorophyll concentration at, at ocean in the ocean, we can already see that there's a high temporal and high spatial variability at inshore and offshore regions. And looking at the, the correlation coefficient there that the bloom, the high peaks that we see at inshore is not necessarily the same at offshore. So the correlation coefficient between inshore and offshore is quite low to say. So we can already see that the concentration of ocean chlorophyll is different at inshore and offshore region. And this is looking at the, the, the boxes that we subsetted in the previous plot that I showed you. So that was also interesting to see how um, variable and how it's this high interseasonal variability in this region. But to sort of scale it down to one year mean, which is a climatology of chlorophyll concentration, we looked at the inshore and offshore still, the inshore represented by the blue line with where the, the, the bold line represents the mean of the month of each month. So we mean all of the months of January from 1997 till 2022. Yes, 2017, 2017, and me created a mean for January, February, March, April, May, until December. And to see how the, when we actually expect a bloom. Um, and we also did the same for offshore region to understand the bloom period in a year timescale. And it, it's already clear to see that the inshore region with is represented by blue and the, the, the shaded area represents the standard deviation of these area. Um, we see two blooms that are normally okay in the inshore region. And that is a bloom that happens in March and another bloom that happens in November towards December. And 
even when the year ends, we still see the, um, the concentration of chlorophyll peaking in that area. But when you look at offshore, we see a bloom that what we could say a bloom or happens in between April and June. And when we see the offshore blooms, we could tell that the offshore blooms last longer. They start late, but they last longer compared to inshore regions where the blooms are quite small, where the, the blooms start late, well, start early, but finish quickly. But we also had two blooms in the inshore region. And this was also interesting to see because um, it still highlights the, the differences that we see in chlorophyll inshore and chlorophyll offshore. And it's also important to note that we have high concentration of chlorophyll in the inshore region compared to the offshore region. Um, so moving forward to our coccolithophores. So one of our uh, one of the things that excited us about this project was being able to, um, to create an algorithm that picks up um, well, to adopt an algorithm that that that, that picks up um, coccolithophores from satellite. I mean, we we already I already highlighted the challenges we had with the uh, coccolithophore data that was co uh, collected at in situ level um, and in situ by by NatMec. Uh, but with this algorithm, it gave us an opportunity to um, look at a coccolithophore um, seasonal variation over a long period of years. So what this algorithm basically did was um, to pick up blooms, to pick up blooms and non-bloom times. So what it, it essentially picks up is the presence and absence. So we couldn't actually pick up the concentration or the specific things or species level. We could only pick up the bloom because coccolithophores have these shells that uh, reflective and you can sort of pick it, pick them up at a certain wavelength from satellite. Um, but again, this was also a representation of presence and absence, not necessarily bloom or non-bloom. So that is important to note with the results that I'm about to present. So again, when we look at a time series of coccolithophore presence, and this, we decided to show a percentage presence of coccolithophores, we can already see that our correlation coefficients of inshore and offshore is quite um, significant. I mean, 6.2, it shows that the it's not too different. The seasonal, the, the, the time series of inshore or the change in presence and inshore offshore is kind of related. And what was interesting to see was that blooms would um, usually initiate in the sort of inshore region. Remember, we're using the squares that we highlighted at inshore and offshore to overlap the, the in situ inshore and offshore 10 and not 10, 70 nautical miles. So we could already see that there's still high variability of the presence in these coccolithophores. Um, and there's also um, spatial variability, although it, it seemed like blooms would start in inshore area and then drag to, and then there's sort of like a delay in, in blooms that are occurring offshore. So it's like blooms would start slightly offshore and then start to increase. You, when you see a peak inshore, it's, it slightly lags toward increasing in the peak that is seen offshore. Um, so to create a climatology of this, we created a, a time, a climatology of longitudinal um, over the longitudinal area. So what am I, what am I trying to say for this? So when you look at the 15 here, this is kind of a map of um, Namibia, not really a map of Namibia, but the coast of Namibia. And going forward is towards the offshore. So the red represents our offshore um, box that we subsetted here, and the blue represents our inshore box that we subsetted. So when you look at the change over a longitudinal um, space, from inch from inshore to offshore, and you look at that change over a year. So we've meaned the presence, we've created a, a sort of a climatology of the presence of these coccolithophores, the same as we did with meaning creating a mean of or an average of January, February, March, April until December. We did this, but with showing a showing it in a sort of a map formula to see change in concentration rather than using a time series or a, 
a climatology that shows a line graph. Um, so what is quite evident to see here was that we still have a high presence of coccolithophores offshore compared to inshore. And that was also evident in our previous um, slot where we see a high red here, the red line was representing a high, con not concentration, I'm sorry, presence of coccolithophores offshore as opposed to uh, the inshore region where it had a lower presence of uh, coccolithophores. So this is also reflected here in the, in the climatology of coccolithophore presence. So although we did see a different in concentration, not concentration, presence of coccolithophores inshore and offshore, but where the more you go offshore, the more you see the presence of coccolithophores. And that's what we could uh, see from the, um, from satellite and hence the yellow here representing a higher presence of coccolithophores. Um, so that was also interested because if you really want to sample and understand the dynamics of coccolithophores, it makes sense to go offshore because that's where most of the bloom usually occurs. So just to recap, um, um, what I just re re uh, presented to you guys was um, the challenges that we have with uh, using in situ data. In situ data, there's a lot of factors that go into um, creating um, this kind of a data or collecting data at, at, at sea and then coming to the lab and analyzing it. And although it's, it's, it's such a, a long process that requires a lot of effort and a lot of resources, it's still important in validating some of the algorithms. And this is the, the algorithms that we create on satellite. We cannot really know if the algorithms are telling the truth until we prove it with what we see at in, 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 in situ areas. And the way kind of differences here and there where we could pick up some cycles that, well, there's some, some trains that are not necessarily picked up in the in situ area because we only had one month to select this data. And with satellite, we have the pleasure of looking at daily change in concentration of chlorophyll or looking at the presence of coccolithophores in a, day, a daily um, um, temporal scale. So um, what I think was important for this, for us to, to learn from this, and this was a the project was um, sort of a, an introduction to the study of sulfate aerosols and there's another master PhD project that was um, that followed this master's uh, project to sort of dive deep into understanding the sulfate aerosols and how that impacts climate change but this study was mostly interested in the community structure and how that changes and how the bloom structures are looking in the northern Benguela pulling system and we could already we could already see from the the, the the results that I just shared with you that the seasonal cycles at inshore and offshore are complex and they're quite different and dye atoms when found to be dominant over coccolith over coccolithophores and dinoflagellates and coccolithophores blooms are much are found much Further offshore than we actually sample. So I think the the furthest um, uh, station where the in situ data uh, take the in situ data was collected is at seventy nautical miles. But if you really want to understand the dynamics of coccolithophores, especially in the northern Benguela pooling system, it would make sense to look at much further stations to understand that dynamics of or the the cycle of climate or the blooms of of coccolithophores, so to say. And I, I and I'm. And because I didn't have a, a, a chance to share, to collect the in-situ data um, that was collected by NatMac group, I had the privilege of being part of the Adriano group in, in 2019. Um, and I had the privilege of going with the Mirabilis at sea and going through the process to understand how this data was created from analyzed collecting sample at sea to collecting phytoplankton data and understanding um, these di atoms and dinoflagellates. And I worked very well with a team of other scientists from all over to try and understand um, the biological interactions that occur in the region and the Benguela upwelling system. So that area is quite close to my heart and it was important for me to make sure I still share some of this work that, <clears throat> that was really helpful. And I mean, we had the privilege of going through the 20, 20 degrees south and 20, 23 degrees south to understand some of the dynamics and uh, the productivity that happened in the um, Panguela upwelling system. And yeah, I just want to thank um, Atrieno and thank Natmed Group for really making this possible for me to understand 
the process that you go through in the lab and the process that you go through in analyzing and creating data at sea. Um, and I mean, CSR and SOCO was really supportive and UCT was really supportive in, in supporting my satellite work and analysis of this data. And yeah, thank you everyone for joining this talk.